my name is Simi J. Patoka, and my pronouns are they, them. Hi, my name is Hannah Crawford, and my pronouns are she, her. And we are... The Dreaming Divas. We are a podcast inspired by the Screaming Divas. And it is our goal to create a similar platform from the perspective of young singers. And today we had on the brilliant Stephen Lee, who I had the pleasure of working with at the Long Reach Opera Workshop, and now we are working together on a bi-weekly basis. Stephen is a corrective phonetics spe specialist for opera singers at the Canadian Opera Company and is also writing his dissertation through the University of Toronto through OISE. Before we get into the interview, we would like to graciously acknowledge that together we reside, learn, and create on the land of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabewaki, Mississauga, Wendaki Nionwinsio, and neutral people. We seek re-indigenization. We stand with the Indigenous community and welcome Indigenous voices on this platform. We are grateful to be working and learning on and about this land, and we honour these communities as the traditional stewards of these lands. We really hope you enjoy this interview. It's a great one, and enjoy. Subscribe. Ding. Ding. <laughs> Ding. I don't know. Here. Steven, thank you so much for coming on the podcast with us. We're so thank excited. Thank you for to inviting you. me. Thank you. Um, would you like to start by uh, saying your land acknowledgements? Yes. So I, I am in Toronto. Um, so the land acknowledgement for Toronto, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the tr traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 of the Mississaugas of the Credit. So we like to start off uh, every interview with a 60 second life story. So I will I hold the I hold the world record currently. So that is Oh, I won't be challenging any world records. And I've got lots of years to cover in 60 seconds. Many more than I, you know. I have like one. So you have like one. You do not. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to do? You can you just say any and everything that comes to mind when you think of your life, I will hold up the timer and it will be reversed for the camera. I apologize to viewers, but uh, <laughs> whenever you are ready. Okay. Um, what will I say? Well, I'm originally from Toronto. Um, I have sort of different sides to me. I am fundamentally, I think, a language person. I collect languages the way people used to collect stamps. Uh, I'm particularly interested in dialects and specifically the pronunciation of languages and dialects. I have a former life as a pianist. I used to live at the piano, but not playing pieces specifically. I was heavily into Hannon, Cherney, scales, arpeggios. I loved all of that. Then I had a longer life as a professional opera singer. And then I went back to school and became a full-fledged academic. So I'm just in the final stages of a PhD at U of T's Faculty of Education, OISE. And with six seconds to spare, I guess that's it for the minute. For the minute. <laughs> that, that was that pretty was good. Yeah. I think you might be the closest thus far. I mean, you can keep on going, but that'll do. <laughs> well, now we have questions specifically for you, so so okay. we'll, we'll jump right into that. Now the nerves begin. Go on. <laughs> so we were wondering, um, generally speaking, how did you arrive into the path that you're on currently? You know, how did you how did you arrive into music? You know, like from your upbringing. In a very backwards kind of way, I guess. Uh, I have a fascination with sound, I guess mm -hmm. is. I always tell people I'm not a music person. I'm a language person with an obscene amount of musical training and education. <laughs> um, so I've ended up in music in sort of 
my own little compartments. As, as I said in the one minute, even as a pianist, I was fascinated by the physicality of the technique of playing the piano. Um, I also have mimicry skills. And so I would mimic other pianists playing um, pieces. And that carried over when I started with singing. Singing really fascinated me, but not music singing, the fireworks of singing, scales, arpeggios, mordants, all of high notes, just fascinated me. And how do people do that? And how do you do that? Um, until finally, I found a way, or it was found for me, to combine the language things that I really love doing with the music education that I have. So I sort of come to it that way. I was going to, I was going to ask actually, when you're talking about your 60 second story about you decided to go back to school, was that how recent of a decision was that for you? <laughs> I've been in school so long now. Um, <laughs> I, I went to university when you're supposed to go to university, um, and then I stopped, and I, I worked. I worked uh, at the airport for quite a long time, and then I went to McGill and got a degree or diploma in music, in voice performance, a licentiate diploma that's a three-year diploma program. And then uh, I needed to get a job. And you need some kind of formal education, really, to enter the workforce. So I went back to the U of T and finished my Bachelor of Arts degree, which took me several years. And I graduated with high marks that then got me into Boise to do a master's degree. I was one of three people accepted into the program because it's one of the few funded master's programs, but only for the first year of the two-year program. So fortunately, I won a shirk for the second year, so that put me through my second year. A lot of people didn't even know there was such a thing as a shirk for a master's, so that was great. Can you explain what a shirk is for the for the viewers? A shirk is yes, thank you. That's you get so used to these words. Let me see if I can do this. The social sciences and humanities SSH uh, research council of Canada, I think is SSHRC. It's kind of the highest level of scholarship that you can win as an academic in graduate school. So I got one of those. And then while I was finishing my master's, I was already accepted into the PhD program. So I say I went to Oise and I never left. Um, so I finished Forever my master's. Student. Pardon? Forever a student. It's coming to an end. It's going to be really weird. Um, I'm going to want to look things up and I won't have access to all the things I have access to at the moment. Um, and then I started the PhD and I've won more awards, lots of, uh, OG Ontario graduate scholarship. Anyway, lots of awards for that, that have put me through. Um, so that's sort of my academic there i started large hole return never left so <laughs> yeah well going off of what you're saying about your time in the education system you do also teach and i recall in one of our lessons you said that you always wanted to do that and so what has it been like learning to become that and and how has it changed from when you started teaching to what you're doing now and and you could even go into your work at the Canadian Opera Company, what you do there as well. So this all started in my 20s when I was supposed to be wanting to be an opera singer. 
And I was found, for lack of a better verb, by Joan Dorneman, who at the time was an assistant conductor and coach at the Metropolitan Opera. I was working at the airport with access to airplanes. So I used to fly to New York and have sessions with her. And I became much more interested in what she was doing and how she was doing what she was doing than what I was supposed to be doing. And uh, I told her on many occasions, I want to do what you do, um, which was, which was, which is this very interesting linguistic approach to coaching because she speaks Italian and English and French and enough German uh, and has coached all of the people you can think of who go and went and sang at the Metropolitan Opera, sang right in front of her and she prepared them for their roles. And I loved that. And I loved our work together. I found it really stimulating. And I found myself when I was singing, if any of my co-workers were having any kind of difficulties in their singing, uh, I would invite them to come with me into a practice room and I would work with them and explain things to them. Um, it's just the way I understand things. It's very process oriented. I think in steps. I need instructions to do things. So in order for someone to do something, I come up with instructions, stepwise instructions. So I've always wanted to do this, except the problem is there is no such thing as going to university and getting a degree in what is called lyric diction instruction. There's no such thing. Um, if you want to be a coach, you can do a degree in collaborative piano. You can do an apprenticeship at the COC, Merrilla, uh, in London, Royal Opera. I mean, there are any number of places where you can go as a pianist and learn how to coach, to be a coach. But there's no academic degree that qualifies you to be a lyric diction instructor. And that irritated me personally because as someone who has spent so many years as a student um, on this side of the desk, I think it's reasonable to expect that the person teaching me is qualified to do what they're doing and has an educational background and has been held accountable by an educational institution for that background. So have written papers and exams and whatever. So I decided to create my own program. And so for my master's degree, I did what I believe is the first empirical study that examined my teaching of my Italian diction course that I had designed. And I examined the course materials, the approach, everything about it. And I invited every professor and researcher I could think of to come and give me feedback as part of sort of an external examination committee. And they all came. <laughs> and there was one day when I was explaining some aspect of phonetics and one of the one of the leading researchers in the world of phonetics was sitting right in front of me. You talk about being nervous. And I got the most wonderful compliments at the end from that person. So it was a great experience. I always said the MA would go into the PhD. It was part of my letter of intent in applying for the MA because I knew it would not be enough. So because of my MA, the way life works, I got invited to come and work at the Canadian Opera Company. And so my research now is to do with working with that level of opera singers and what is the pedagogical content knowledge required to be a lyric diction instructor. It, the title is that and includes a search for instructor qualifications. No, if, I think it's, in, oh, yeah. sorry. Oh, no, go I ahead. Say, I think it's interesting you mentioned that because, um, Simi, I don't know if you've taken any lyric diction classes at university. We both graduated at the same time, different schools. And I remember the biggest thing about, I took 
two semesters of lyric, I guess three semesters of lyric diction classes from three different professors, as well as studio. And the, it was shocking to me how varied the pedagogy was. Yes. And I know it's, I know it's definitely from, you know, a different point of view and who taught who and who did, who studied where, but I think it's really important the work you're doing because it, it should be kind of regulated, I think, especially for a young developing singer. It's, I think that's really important. Yes, Hannah. Uh, also, because it is 2021 and we all have access to information, the good, the bad and the ugly, um, things need to be regulated. There really are actual linguistics courses. There are actual phonetics courses. This information exists. Sometimes it's only across the road from, for example, a faculty of music. And it's just shocking to me because I've also taken the same courses that you took, that both of you took. Um, and it's really shocking because I did it sort of backwards. After I had had all that training, I then went into academics. And you sit there and you go, oh, that's what it actually is. Oh, that's what the IPA chart, all of it actually is. Uh, mm -hmm. and how it functions and why, etc. And what is a vowel? And what is a consonant? What is it? How do you do it? And, and you think, you're a singer, you vowel for a living. And can you, <laughs> can you define what a vowel even is? Whereas a first year phonetics student, no previous uh, prerequisites, and take a course when you're whatever 18 19 years old on day one you have to learn what what a consonant is what a vowel is how human beings produce sound it's all very basic it doesn't go into all the millions of dollars that we all spend on voice lessons etc um yes <laughs> so but, that's yeah. Yeah. go away so i'm you begun to answer this question with with what you were just speaking about with pedagogy and stuff but so when we're looking at the lyric diction and classes that we're taking in our undergrad or master's mm -hmm. degree for example how does what you teach differ from that um so i divide my life into two parts there is the corrective phonetics part um, and there is the what is the so-called lyric diction part. I mean, for me, the word diction is literally cliche. If you find the origin of the word cliche, where the tiles were clicked together for the printing press, because we're going to need it in a minute anyway. So just leave them all clicked together. Don't keep disassembling and reassembling. So you use some things over and over again, and it loses its original meaning. Um, Diction almost has a meaning by every person who uses the word. And so that's the first problem for me is that, well, what even is it? So for me, it, it's very organized. Um, you need to be able to create the required sounds in the beginning. So this is the phonemic inventory. Do you have the phonemic inventory for the language that you are trying to sing in? Um, and if you don't, then we will go and get them for you and figure out who they are and how they are produced by a human being in both spoken and sung varieties, because it's the same and different. And, and why? And what is different? So it's, it's just like you want to go and make, I always use falafel because I've tried to make falafel. Um, if you've got chickpeas and you've got the ingredients, but you don't have cumin, coriander, and salt, pepper, and the rest, uh, it will look like a falafel, but it will not smell like a falafel or taste like a falafel. So if you don't have the vowel and consonant ingredients required for a particular language, it's just not going to sound like that language. And there are reasons upon reasons which I have had to study and read about as to why that is and how it works and it's all very interesting and it to this day tickles me when people do things and I think I know why you're doing what you're doing I have read about this I, 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 it, it's just so cool that 
that the human language production happens in very highly researched ways and knowing how to mitigate and or work around and or add to uh, these processes is it's really amazing and that i love doing that who would spend 20 minutes on an uval i mean i would happily but i don't know anybody else who would get such joy and excitement over helping somebody find their closed e sounds and um once you've got it then it's it, that that for me is the joy well you and you i know, spent I two full lessons trying to get e <laughs> <laughs> yeah literally i was actually just thinking about this um i recently did a program this summer with iydv and um i was one of the very few canadians that were in the program it was a lot of american singers and I remember I spent a lot of time on diction and phonetics and stuff because their, especially E's and A's for them was totally different than what I've been taught before. And I'm just, I was wondering, like, how do you, how do you approach that when you work with a singer who's been taught with kind of a vowel that isn't quite true, you know, do you know, like a, a true E vowel? Well, I start at the beginning of human sound production and work my way I, I it i don't know why i've never done this but i've seen it where you have a tire that has like a bicycle tire that has a hole in it and a way of finding the hole is to put it in water and you squeeze it and when the bubbles come out you know you've found so i sort of go back to the beginning of well how do you make a neutral sound and now what is the goal uh vowel and how do we get to that and all of the components? So it's, I always say, I, I have a driver's license and I was trained in forward, backward, and stop. Um, but if you are a car mechanic, yes, you do forward, backward, and stop. But if you hear something, it means something to you because you know how to open up the hood and you know what the carburetor is and where the oil goes and, and you know that and for me a singer a professional singer needs to know th the same things as any other highly trained skilled person in their field would know the unfortunate difference is fortunate unfortunate the asterisk of music in music is that you cannot give even the most gifted or is going to be the most gifted violinist in the world, a violin at the age of fill in the blank. And for them, it's just a piece of furniture or a piece of wood. They have to learn how it works. They have to master all of the techniques, etc. Whereas if a person is a singer, there's a certain amount that's ready to go um someone who is going to be a singer before they've had any lessons can get through a song whether that song is an aria um you have somebody like beverly sills you can see it on youtube her at six seven eight years old singing you know you can't do that as a pianist you can't be even a protege and just put your hands on the keys for the first time and Rachmaninoff somehow comes out of the piano. <laughs> so, nice. yeah, but we somehow are able to sort of kind of get away around that with singing. Pianists have to know how their fifth finger works, how their fourth finger works. Um, spend many hours of exercises with their teachers, Hannon, Cherdney, how independent finger action, what kind of a repeated note, etc. So I like to do that. Um, how do you make a sound? How do you turn that sound into this vowel as opposed to that vowel? What's the difference? What does it sound like on these notes? Where is your speaking range? What is below? What is above? And once we've sorted all of that out, then we move on um, linguistically to, for example, syllabic structure. And these are just the fundamental basics of pronunciation acquisition in the field of pronunciation acquisition, pronunciation pedagogy. So again, I'd like to take credit for the fact that I invented these processes, but sadly I did not. 
The problem is that the departments don't inform each other from each other. But it's all there. This information is there. That's why I've had to do so much. So in a dissertation, typically you have one chapter that is your literature review, where you go through and say, here's everybody and what they all said on the subject. And here's what they missed, and this is what I'm bringing. Mine has three chapters of literature. Um, one of them is actually two chapters, but I did not split it into two chapters. So it could have been a fourth chapter, but I kept it in the one. So I have three literature review chapters trying to capture all of the information required for this field of work. It's very multidisciplinary. You um, were just kind of leading into um, the linguistic topic um, right there. And what I'm really fascinated by which I recall you saying to me once, was that you hear things that other people don't hear. And apparently. Like, apparently, but I was wondering if you could put into words, like you listen to the way someone speaks and you notice these little things, like what are these things that you notice and, and how do you hear them and how do you work with them in your mind? What process do you go through? As a child, so my family is from Ireland and the United Kingdom. And we used to go to London every year. Um, and London's a very interesting place because perhaps less so now and more so then, people sounded like the area that they came from. And what was interesting to me were the variations as you move geographically north, south, east, or west from a given point. There were certain sound variations that were predictable that I would notice and then became predictable. And this was something I heard even as a child. Um, it's just something I hear. Uh, the ability to hear what's called cross-linguistic uh, influence, CLI, cross-linguistic in interference, influence, um, in someone's speech pattern. Um, there was one example where I was watching a TV show <laughs> where one of the guests had a very interesting way of speaking. And I thought, this person sounds like they had started out in South Africa, but there's definitely England in there. But now you can hear they lived in the United States. So I do what I always do. I go and look them up on the internet. And that was exactly it. They were born in South Africa. They had done their university training in England and then had lived in the United States since so-and-so. I hear that. Um, people give themselves away in their speaking. And that fascinates me. Um, Speech patterns fascinate me. Intonation fascinates me. Rhythm, rhythms. Um, so when I'm dealing with human sound production, for some reason, I hear the finished product of people's sounds as the arrangement of the articulators inside. So I was working with one of my students and he was doing something and I said, no, your tongue's too high at the front. And he laughed because his, his tongue was too high at the front. And he was, well, how do you hear that? And I, I'm fed up with that question. So now I was like, how do you not hear that? <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> all I can hear is that. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I have that kind of hearing. I have that kind of wiring in my brain. Uh, it really hasn't served me <laughs> for any purpose until I found this line of work where basically it's all I do all day. I sort of disappear into this place where I I sort of see, I see it in front of me. What the per I, I hear people's sound through some kind of visualization that's going on in my mind. I don't know if that has a name. I haven't found it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I always remember being told that you don't try to imitate what's like, if you're trying to focus on a vowel, you don't try to imitate the sound they're making. You have to feel it in your mouth. 
instead of trying to imitate it, which I if found you can, really helpful. If you can. So what I when I show the IPA chart, I say that this is both diagnostic and instructive. Mm -hmm. Because the IPA chart does tell you which body parts of the articulators go where and what they do once they get there, and therefore you have this sound. So what is interesting is if someone I'm working with is creating a sound, this is where I love Zoom, um, I will do a screen share. Is that what it's called? It's share screen, yeah. And bring up the IPA chart, and I will point to the sound that they are making, and I will point to the target sound, and I will show the journey, and I will demonstrate. You're doing this, and this is the sound of the articulators moving into an orientation that would then create the target sound. That's something that works. But if imitation alone were possible, you would just take a student and plonk them in front of a TV set and hit say, here, listen to Italian. Your prescription is, please listen to Italian for five uninterrupted hours. And by the end of that, you will sound like it doesn't work. Um, so more is required, more explicit instruction is required. I was, I was also, sorry, I might be pivoting a little bit here, but I was wondering if you could um, give a little, a little intro to your idea of breaking up the production of sound into three layers, because you've spoken to me about that several times, especially in um, uh, the Long Reach Opera Workshop where we met. There's, there's what happens down here, what happens here, and what happens here. Can you, can you explain it in your own words? What Again, not mine. Um, on day one of the phonetics course, um, human sound is described as requiring three elements, an air source, a sound source, and a place of resonance. I remember quite clearly, because I'd only spent about $3.7 billion in voice lessons at that point, point. I'm thinking there's all of those hours and hours of lessons watered down into three points. It, it's just incredible. So air source is an entire field of discussion. I have had breathing for opera lessons. I had them in New York. Someone who only specialized in teaching breathing for opera singers. She had studied with Montserrat Caballé, so it was sort of that tradition. Air uh, sound source is everything to do with the vocal cords in the surrounding area and the tongue. And place of resonance is, well, now that you've made a sound, where does it then resonate so that you can be heard? Because for the stage, you've got distance. For the operatic stage, you've got distance plus an orchestra making a lot of noise. So there, there are all these factors. Again, I did not didn't make that up either. <laughs> That's all known. But it's so interesting. And I love how you it really is. It, this, uh, that's the first time I've heard of it, actually. So maybe I usually partner practice. And oh, nice. um, they mentioned it to me. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> the things that Stephen tell me, I tell as many people as I can because they're oh, brilliant. Okay. Uh, thank you, Simi. <laughs> again, it, I didn't, I'm just sort of the transportation unit. I'm not really the information or the destination. I just sort of bring the information out of the place. It's all public domain. <laughs> this <stuff. laughs> But I remember um, one of our first times working together, you were talking about Farinelli and how you, you had this moment where you were thinking about, oh, if I continue to expand my rib cage, even as I'm exhaling, this happens. And you said, and then I learned that someone else came up with that. I still think it's so cool that you still figured it out on your own to begin with, even if someone else figured it out too. That's crazy to me. <laughs> that, that has happened to me several times in my research. I've come up with these brilliant ideas that I have then discovered have already been, this is why you have to do a literature review. Um, because is it your brilliant idea or is it an already existing brilliant idea that everybody knows about? 
a lot of it is just logical. Um, and a lot of it is based on what I have been taught. So I guess what I have been taught, it arrived to me possibly from those Farinelli breathing exercises. So maybe I reversed engineered my way back to where it had come from. I was thinking about um, when I was reading, I read, I creeped your website. I hope that's okay. I figured it was fine. I'm so excited. Someone has looked at my website. <laughs> Um, and I saw like with your work with the COC and it got me to thinking like, how often would you suggest on, on an outsider looking in perspective, how often would you suggest working with addiction specialist? Like how often do, does, do you work with people at the COC? Like how does, how does all that work? Well, it depends. It depends on their schedule. Um, if they are in rehearsal, so I work with the ensemble studio. Mm -hmm. And if they are in the middle of an opera, then they're in the middle of an opera. And uh, they are busy. They are sitting in staging rehearsals all day long, etc. But before that, <laughs> when they are fair game, um, I am one of the core trainers. And there are several of us. I'm just one of them. And I like to to see people um, twice a week, sometimes yeah. three times a week. It depends. It's not, it's, it is so not all about me. It is in fact so all about the learner. And uh, a lot depends on learner, what they want, um, what their ambitions are, what they, how they like to work, um, what motivation is huge. So, and I don't work for everybody. And yeah. I am very quick to tell people, um, I work really, really, really well for some people. And I really, really don't for others. And I'm okay with that. That's normal for me. I will do my best with the entire arsenal of pedagogical approaches that I have, and even ones I haven't invented yet, I will try and invent something. But sometimes it doesn't work, and that's fine. So it depends. It really depends. It is a partnership. It is all about the learner and not all about me. It is a learner-based pedagogy and not teacher-based, that sort of fortunately gone going going not gone yet but going going so it depends i i know we we just kind of uh brushed over um the work you do at the coc a little bit um but i i was wondering since you work at the canadian opera company which is the biggest opera company in canada um do you have any stories particularly one comes to mind about an original Screaming Diva Carry Alchema. Um, because you, you, of course, you come across uh, people at the top of their field that, that come through Toronto and sing at the COC. So if you'd like to share the Carry Al Alchema story or any other stories, I'm happy to hear them. Part of what I was really lucky. So she recently retired, um, Nina Dorganich, the one who the person who hired me uh, to work there. One of the things she said to me in terms of being a lyric diction person is how do you learn to be a lyric diction person in an opera house without working in an opera house? So you have to, so I'm part of the miracle that is this portion of my life's program has been the fact that I've had my theoreticals at OISE and my practicum at the COC. And I was allowed to go into rehearsals. If I had time, uh, I was allowed, as long as nobody minded, I could sort of go and hide in a rehearsal. And the COC was doing a production of Tosca, which I love, that opera. Um, and Carrie Alkama and Adrian Piachonka were the two Toscas, double cast. And Adrian Piachonka hadn't arrived yet. And Carrie Alkema was doing the preliminary staging rehearsals. And I just sort of followed her. Um, 
I followed Adrian as well. When she came, it was sort of like two different flavors of fabulous going on. Um, it was amazing. So I just followed um, the two of them. Carrie Alkama was was so wonderful, uh, a different kind of Tosca than than Adrian Pichonka, and it was just to really love the two different kinds. You see, this is what's so important, is you have to, if it is learner-centered, your thinking, you have to find a way, and I did, I had nothing to do with their work at all, I was just an observer. You have to find a way to help the learner, the singer in this case, be their spectacular kind of fabulous and not impose your self on them, but help them to become the best, the best version of themselves. And so there were two, two complete, like the Tenerari at the beginning, two different women, uh, two different Toscas, two different kinds of amazing. It was a great, it was a great show. I, um, uh, I went to almost every staging rehearsal, the orchestra rehearsals. Yeah, it was great. They're they're an amazing two amazing sopranos. Well, world class singing. I'm so glad you said that you as as the I'll say educator, you know, you are not to impose the way that you see a role or a viewpoint a, a staging point because i find that um what's actually really rewarded i have found in my limited time in this field it's really rewarded when you are absolutely nothing like anything they've ever seen before they don't want a carbon copy i've seen that in the musical theater field as well no one's interested in seeing the same show twice so i'm so glad you said that um i'm also curious if you wanted to share the um time the, the point at which you met Carrie Alkema and and maybe unless you don't want to embarrass yourself a little bit <laughs> you're thinking not of Carrie Alkema you're thinking of uh Sandra Rodvanovsky oh that was with Sandra oh, oh. I was hoping that you were not going to ask me about that I <laughs> you don't have to I just thought it was funny, but you don't have to share. I was at, I went and sat in on Sandra Radvanovsky rehearsing, I think Norma, I think. And I try and sit in an inconspicuous location in the corner. So there I was in my corner at a table. I didn't realize that inconspicuous corner table was the table where everyone had put their stuff. So I sat there watching Sandra Radvanovsky be incredible. And when she had finished, she came over to get her stuff. And it was one of those moments when my Brita filter between my brain and my mouth was simply not engaged. And I just looked at her and I said, you have got the most incredible voice that I have been in the same room as. And I thought, first of all, that was ungrammatical. I can't believe I just said that. And second of all, I can't believe I just said that. It just burst out of me, but I was so riled up. And this was in one of my earlier days um, at the COC. Another incredible, it, 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 the, I spend a lot of time being sort of overwhelmed with, by what is happening in front of me, um, vocal production wise. It, it really is incredible. There are others that I've got to, and of course, in the background, I'm sort of collecting data in my brain. What are they doing? How are they doing this? What is the body doing that is therefore creating or eliciting this finished product. That fascinates me. So that, yeah, that. <laughs> Sorry, what Wait. was that, Anna? I'm just impressed you were able to make a coherent sentence around Sandra, to be honest. Well, it, that for me was bas barely, co <laughs> I just, 
it's like one of those movies where the character says something and then they like, I did not just say that. I did not just do that. <laughs> well, Sandra seems like a lovely person. I'm sure she took it like with such kindness. Oh, she absolutely did. She absolutely did. But I was just like dying. <laughs> wow. I love that. Well, Amazing. we could take a little bit of a left here. We were wondering, um, we both know that you speak a bunch of languages. So I, we were wondering, how many do you speak and why and how did you get there? And what are they? <laughs> That's two. <laughs> okay. This, this is like my party trick at when anybody, this, I get asked this all the time, in other words. Um, one of the courses I took at the U of T, uh, at OISE, with my supervisor, um, I think our first assignment was to write our language biography or language autobiography. Um, so a few, but see, the problem is define the word speak. That's the problem. Um, so English came first, but I have several varieties of English that I speak. Now I am speaking Canadian or my best attempt at Canadian. Um, I learned that uh, later as a child, I made a conscious effort to learn how to speak as Canadian as possible. Um, the first other language I learned was French. It was on Sesame Street at the time, so I heard it there. And this fascinated me. And at the time we started having all of our labels on food, they were all required to be in both languages. So I started looking at the two columns and trying to equate, well, if this is what it is in English on the left, this surely must be it in French. So I started decoding that as a child. Then, then eventually I went to Hebrew night school to learn Hebrew. That was going very slowly. I was bored. So I asked to go to Hebrew day school. My mother hired a tutor for me and I caught up. This was in grade three. So I caught up three years worth of Hebrew in a month and just went directly into the rest of the class. In grade six, I got bored again, so I decided I would study Greek because I wanted to study a language whose alphabet was different to English. So I went to Greek school, which I now know is the Heritage Language Program. It's funny, there is a professor at OISE who deals with the Heritage Language, and I didn't know that's what I was, what I had gone to. So I learned about that much later in life. Uh, then in high school, one of my teachers was also an Arabic teacher, so I decided I would learn Arabic. That sort of started and stopped and didn't happen properly until I started working at the airport. One of my very good friends was from Egypt. So I bought a book and did the exercises and she very kindly corrected the exercises and then we would speak to each other in Arabic. So I was learning modern standard Arabic and Egyptian dialect. Later on, I went, when I went back to the U of T, I took Arabic for three years at the U of T. So I have a minor in near Middle Eastern studies because of that. Uh, I have an Irish passport through my mother. So I thought it's pretty disgusting. I don't speak that language. So I went and taught myself Irish. And then I took that for a year and a half at the U of T. Oh, Italian. Italian, uh, I started singing at 19-ish, and of course everything was in Italian. And then when I started working at the airport, a lot of my friends were first-generation Italian Canadians, meaning their parents had immigrated in the 50s and 60s to Canada. So I started speaking their southern central Italian dialect with them, which was horrifying to Italian diction. Well, it wasn't horrifying. They were greatly entertained by the fact that I would sing 
Puccini with a southern Italian accent. Anyway, I had to learn how to I had to learn how to sing in standard Italian. Um, so then my bachelor's degree, I have a major in Italian language learning and a minor in Italian culture and communication studies or something like that. So I did Italian for my whole undergraduate. Uh, I've done bits and pieces of Russian. The friend from Egypt was Armenian, so or is Armenian, so I went to Armenian school for a while. Uh, German. Um, in my middle teens, I became friends with a family who became like my adopted family. They were from Germany. And the father decided that if I was going to be an opera singer, I would end up in Germany, so therefore I must learn to speak German. So he just started speaking to me in German. And I don't know how that worked, but one day eventually I could speak German. And it was the language I spoke the most at the airport. I spoke German every day at the airport. Uh, what else? I don't speak Spanish, but I can pretend. Uh, other bits and pieces, languages that are a word here and a word there. So when people say, how many languages do you speak? I will say six that I will admit to, varying levels in each of those, but then passengers would show up who could that could only speak like Swedish. And so I would use the tiny vocabulary I have. They'd say to me, but I, you told me you didn't speak this language. And I'd say, well, I don't, <laughs> but you just did. Yeah, but that's not really speaking the language. So it depends. Well, that's it's, it's actually, people. you say six, oh. I counted 10. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, well, again, I mean, I wouldn't say that I spoke Irish, but I have done an Irish oral exam with an Irish teacher who was visiting from Ireland. She was the TA. And I didn't know that I could have a whole conversation with someone in Irish at a fundamental level with her help, but we did have a conversation. So I don't know. It depends. It depends what you need me to say. If you want to go banking, that's a whole different subject. If you want to pass the time of day, then the, it depends. Depends. It's funny. I, I remember I am at university. I did a minor in German. And so I, my teacher was from northern Germany. So she didn't really teach in, in high German. And but I'm doing my music degree at the same time. And so I remember going to my classes and being very confused. I'd be like, that's how you say that. <laughs> but it worked out eventually. But I remember initially, I was like, why is it so different? <laughs> We don't we don't have this concept that they have in many languages of diglossia, meaning you speak two varieties of the same language, quote unquote. If you are an Arabic speaker, the textbook that you're reading, the newspaper that you're reading, the essay that you're writing is in a different, very different, somewhat different language to how you will talk about it with your friends. Um, people function in two languages. If you are in, in Switzerland, you are speaking a different language than the language of your newspapers um, and your textbooks. And ditto the pronunciation. So this is where, when I'm working with somebody, the first thing we have to do is define Okay, I want you to teach me how to do this in German. Okay, well, first we need to define German. What German? Which German? Um, so are we doing standard stage German pronunciation? Or are we doing Bavarian dialect? Like for... Was yeah, because some operas have different dialects of German. I too. think it's Rosenkavalier that, that... Yeah, I think so. Yeah, is in yeah. Bavarian, which is great. That's so the family, the mother was from Munich. So I sound decidedly... Southern when I speak German. Um, it's not my fault. <laughs> so that. Um, 
French is another very hot topic that I try very much to stay away from. Um, there are so many kinds. So what I try and do is when I'm working with somebody, I will say, look, here are the, here's what you may find, because I don't care. I don't have a religious conviction one way or the other. I'm not in charge. Uh, your conductor may be in charge. Your coach may be in charge. My job is to teach you how to make those sounds when called upon so to do. Um, can you make these sounds? If somebody says, you know, the word is such and such, no problem. Um, as opposed to the word is such and such, and then what? I didn't know that. I've never heard. Oh, I don't know how to make that. So, so you don't have that. So I like to help people to become armed, to be compliant with the authorities, <laughs> the people who are in charge. The one nice thing about going to a Canadian university in a music undergrad is they kind of beat the proper French into you. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> but if you go to the United States or if you have American singers, they have a different, by and large, a different idea on certain, yeah. on certain. And there are two schools, at least two major that divide up of pronunciation. And um, again, it's not for me to say, it's not for me to impose. It's just for me to teach you how, look, you maybe, can you do this? If someone asks you to do this, could you? Yes, yeah. great. So try doing it this way and see if they like it. And if they don't, they just switch. Part of the thing with singers is singers are not language learners. It, it's not, if you're a singer, you are there for. Um, singers have to be pronunciation learners, that you have to. Um, and the trade-off is that you get to rehearse. Your text is written. It is grammatically perfect. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and you have the time to rehearse until it's correct and or perfect, um, whatever that means. And you have time to acquire the sounds that you need to do that you have to do that more than a typical language learner for whom pronunciation is a component. They have to learn verbs and how they work, nouns and how they work, syntax, grammar, and spontaneous speech. Can you just now go and have a conversation on the following subject? Go. A singer doesn't have to do that. So um, it's great to study a language, but I I don't impose that burden on a singer. It's very time consuming, very brain consuming. And if you've got singing to do, that's sort of the focus of your life. You don't have time necessarily to do two to three hours of language study every day where you should be doing, and rightly so, two to three hours of music prep every day. So I, I would be fair on myself. It's not your field. It's something you want to do, sure. But it's it's not compulsory and it shouldn't be. All right. Rapid fire. We have our mugs. Um Steven, you feel free to say the first thing that comes to mind. <sighs> Don't stress, it's okay. I know it's scary. Um I'm just... here I was getting so calm and relaxed. Okay, go on. <laughs> What was something that made you happy today? This, this made me happy. This was really nice. You make a beautiful atmosphere to be in the midst of. And I had a feeling that might happen, but I just forgot myself and felt very comfortable. And so, yeah, that was, thank you. It was a lovely, it was a lovely afternoon. It makes it a lot easier when you have guests that are so open and easy to talk to as oh, well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Very well. What movie or television character represents you best? <laughs> I'm laughing. I'll tell you why I'm laughing. I desperately needed something to watch a lot of 
And one of my friends recommended to me that I watch Grey's Anatomy because I had never oh, seen any it. of it. Yeah. And they said to me, there are 17 seasons. It will keep you busy. <laughs> so I am currently obsessed with Bailey. <laughs> I am yeah. absolutely obsessed as a teacher, as a no nonsense. It's so not how I function. Uh, I don't think I could function like that, but sometimes I hear her speech pattern because she has a very definite speech pattern, which I love. She is a great voice, physical voice actress. Um, I find her amazing how she gets her point across um, through the use of prosody and language and timing and rhythm. And so she's my current linguistic actress obsession speech pattern person so it's funny because that's very now <laughs> amazing i knew you were gonna say grace not because we talked about it oh, okay um who do you fan person over specifically opera singers uh well as a teenager i was obsessed with beverly sills like to a point of ridiculousness. Um, that was me as a teenager. Then I branched out to others. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sort of... I'm not sort of that way. The sound of people's voices fascinates me because of certain things that they do while they're doing it. Sandra Rodvanovsky, when I was listening to her do like a messa di voce, um, the way she would change her production to match how she was saying what she was saying, just the, the control that she had over her vocal mechanism. It was sort of like um, Argerich, the pianist, but having that kind of control over your instrument, I just thought that was amazing. I love that kind of, but no, I don't have, I don't have a particular anybody. Sorry. Good answer. It's okay. So that's funny. I think we have two questions that are very similar. Um, we have, who is your current opera singer, like living crush? <laughs> but that's kind of the same question. <laughs> I have to think I'll have to find one, I guess. I will I will have to find one. It can I, still be Sandra like, Rybanovsky. That's one of it's mine. True. That's mine, yeah. I, I will have to find one next time. <laughs> I'll ask you a real question then. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to your younger self? <laughs> the longest one. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, it's been such a mess of tours, detours, untours, left turns going right and right turns go wrong way down the one way street. But somehow it's all coming together so much later than really, did it really have to take this long for it all to sort of all come together? I, I think I, my advice would be don't ask about the future. Just don't, don't want to know. <laughs> don't, because you just, you won't, you, no one would go through this knowingly. Just don't ask. Oh, Stephen, are you a morning or a night person? Oh, <laughs> I don't even know what planet I'm on first thing in the morning. <laughs> like, oh, night person. Just gotcha. do not, do not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, not in the morning. No. Uh, what was the most recent thing you have learned? Hmm. Um, the most recent thing I've learned is that I do in fact know what I'm doing when I'm writing the findings chapters of my dissertation. Uh, it is the craziest thing 
you are the first person to be doing what you're doing. So how do you know how to do what you're doing when nobody's done this before? It's just, it's craziness. Um, and it takes a long time to figure it out. But when you finally arise, oh, this is what I'm supposed to have done now that I've done it. So yes, I'm enjoying that finally that's getting done. This may happen. Mazel tov. Thank you. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> soon. 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 Um, I, at Sumi, do you have any more? I have one more. Okay, I have, this is my last one. Okay. What is your pet peeve? So something that really annoys me. Other than people being bad at language. I'm kidding. <laughs> Vocal cords that don't come to get the other prop. Breathy voice. Breathy voice drives me mad. Now, yeah. And when I worked in the reservations office, I would have people on the phone with me. Hi, I'd like to book a flight. And oh, I hate it, that. It would oh, just yep. drive me. And I want to yell at them. Do you know your vocal cords are not coming together properly? <laughs> it's that in people that. speaking with too much vocal fry. It's like it's like the two opposite. It's the other. Things. It's the other. Creak. This is called creaky voice. Creaky voice and breathy voice, which have IPA diacritic mark symbols, by the way. <laughs> I just put uh, it. I did not. That was the put most recent. Plug in. I put a plug <laughs> yeah. in for the International Phonetics Association. Yes. <laughs> um, Stephen, can you can you tell um, our audience where they can find information about you, where they can uh, reach out to contact you? I do have a website. <laughs> it will be in the description. Okay, it is Stephen Lee. One word. Stephen with a V. Lee is L E I G H, like Vivian. Um, StephenLee.ca because .com was taken, so I am .ca, and there's a contact Stephen button in there somewhere. If if you wanna, you can. And you should. Should. Thank you both so extremely much for today. Thank you. Thank you. This was such a pleasure. We're so happy we could have you on. And I I, am, I know Cass is sad that she couldn't be here for this one, but. I miss sure. Cass. A big hello to Cass. Will do. <laughs> I'm sure and, she'll and Hannah, so lovely to meet you. Yes, you too. You are both wonderful hosts of a lovely idea. <laughs> Thank you. Our idea wasn't original either. If, you, if that makes you feel any better about all of your ideas. <laughs> Look, as long as you cite your sources, it's not plagiarism. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Would you like a, an MLA or APA? We are APA. Okay. Not that I'm not that I'm perfect at it at all, but um, I've been. No one ever is. APA. No I'm, one ever is. Well, then they change it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stephen, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we wish you well, and I will see you in eight days. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Will you get to know a different kind of person through language? It breaks down barriers that it's just incredible to have to have a few words in a in a language the other person doesn't suspect that you in a million years would be able to speak and just an immediate connection that the other person thinks well that they're just things that i know i don't have to explain to you because you you might not be one of us but you know i don't have to explain certain things it's it's a great way to break down barriers if there are any through language learning it's great